where is it? I clearly, I heard the door open. I heard the bells. I heard the pot. I heard the footsteps. I saw the door open. I see the thing walk in. I watched it walk down the aisle. I watched it bend over. It's in the room. Where is it? And this is night one. There's two more nights of this and it gets worse. When I was 16 years old, I was an avid snowboarder. Starting from the time I was like 12 years old, I used to always go snowboarding with the same two guys, my two very close friends, Wolf and Nick. Every winter, me, Nick, and Wolf would go up to Nick's family's cabin that was up in the, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Just snowboard and it was great. Every time we went up to this cabin in New Hampshire, it would be me, Wolf, Nick, and then Nick's mom and dad. Unexpectedly, leading into my 16-year-old winter, Nick's father passed away. We were actually planning on going on a trip to the mountains that, that winter. And I remember speaking to Wolf and being like, I don't even, I don't know if it's even appropriate to ask uh, about this trip because we knew that Nick was very close to his father and not to mention like every time we went on this particular, you know, trip up to the mountains, the Nick's dad was always with us. And it just seemed like, how can we possibly now go on this snowboarding trip? Not only is it a low priority item, but just the dynamic is, is all different now. Nick called us and was like, hey, so uh, we are still gonna do the snowboarding trip to the, the cabin in New Hampshire. And so, you know, Wolf and I, we spoke and we're like, let's just go with it. I mean, maybe it's like, maybe they want to do something that is, that is maybe is a fond memory of their, their father, their husband, and so we agreed to go. So he passes away maybe a few months, maybe a few months before we end up going up to the mountains. And so, the the grief was still definitely there but also just again that the dynamic was very it was like the elephant in the room right like as we're driving up we drove in the same car uh me wolf nick and the nick's mom was driving it was so apparent that nick's dad was missing because he was always in the car with us when we drove up anyhow uh so we make the trip up to new hampshire and we're planning to be up there for three days so the the house itself wasn't really a cabin it was a house it was a small house it was on a mountain. And if you think about the way a mountain works, it's a slope. And so in order to have a house level on a mountain, a portion of it needs to be on stilts, right? The portion that's kind of hanging off the mountain. And then the other part of the house is kind of like embedded in the mountain itself. And when you drive up to the house, there's a wraparound porch that goes around the house. The majority of it is on the stilted section of, of the house, right? So if you're on the wraparound porch, uh, your footsteps are going to echo. Like you can hear those footsteps because you're, you're, you're above the ground. When you step into the house, you open a door. Uh, it actually opens inwardly. There were sleigh bells that were on the door, on the inside of the door. So anytime you open the door, you hear those sleigh bells ringing. And as soon as you step foot into the house, if you took one step into the house, right? So you, you step on the wraparound porch, you open the door, sleigh bells ring. When you step into the house, your right foot would be in the kitchen. You'd be standing on, on linoleum and your left foot would be on shag carpet, which is like the dining room. And uh, that's the way the house is laid out. As soon as you walk in, kitchen on your right, uh, dining room on your left. And if you keep walking, you're gonna enter into this living room. And if you turned around in the living room and looked up, you would see a, um, a lofted second floor. Um, if you walk into the house, again, your right foot's in the kitchen, your left foot's in the dining room, and you walked as if you were going into that living space, but stopped about halfway across the house, you could look to your right and there'd be one hallway. There's only one hallway, it's a small house. And this hallway is bringing you, call it, into the mountain. If you think about, again, the layout of the house, you have a portion of the house that's sitting in the mountain and a portion of the house that's on stilts. Well, this hallway leads into the section of the house that's in the mountain. And if you go down this hallway and it turns left, it's a short little hallway, it brings you to one room. And that room is where me, Nick, and Wolf would stay every time we went snowboarding at this mountain. That room, if you go into it, it's a corner fed room. Uh, you open the door and immediately to your right, is a bunk bed. I would, I would always sleep on the bottom bunk and Wolf would sleep on the top bunk. Our feet would be closest to the door. In the center of the room with the remaining space, because this is not a big room, there was like a, a 
queen size bed. It was like a, a slightly larger bed that sat basically in all of the free space that was left over in the room. It was sitting right in the middle of the room and that's where Nick would sleep. So basically the room was completely packed with three places to sleep and really not much else. There was a very small space between the queen size bed and the uh, bunk bed. So you could walk between those two, but that was about it. So that layout's very important and you'll see why. We snowboard for the day, we come back to the cabin and me, Nick and Wolf decide we're gonna crash super early and get up early and have a full day of riding ahead of us because we're avid snowboarders. So we, we go to our room, the one that's kind of, you go down that hallway and you get to the room I just described. We plan on going to bed early, but we were excited and so we stayed up gaming for a bit. And then maybe around like 11 or 12 o'clock at night, uh, Nick, who again is in the queen size bed and Wolf was in the top bunk, they ultimately fall asleep. I was still awake. And what struck me, and it always struck me whenever I slept in this room, is when you turn off all the electronics and you're just laying in bed in this house, in particular, this, this room, it is pitch black. There's no windows. You're in the segment of the house that's you know in the mountain. It is truly pitch black. Not to mention the house itself, there weren't really any neighbors nearby because this house, uh, Nick's family had purchased it a while ago when this used to be an active ski resort, the mountain itself that it was on, but it wasn't anymore. And most people that were living there had left and sold their property, uh, but a few people had decided to stay. And so Nick's family was one of them. So they had this cabin on an abandoned ski resort. Uh, there was virtually no street lights. There's virtually no neighbors. And so at night, when you're laying in this room, like I was this night, you're really struck by just how dark and quiet it is. I mean, basically no white noise. I mean, silence and pitch black. And so I'm laying there. And one other detail that needs to be uh, brought up before we get into what actually happens. So Nick had two much older brothers. They were in their 30s and you know, we're 16 years old. And um, we were expecting one of them, we didn't know which, to swing by the house at some point over the next few days. Uh, that's what Nick's mom had said. Nick had kind of reiterated it. And I think that Wolf and I understood that, you know, now that Nick's father was gone, that they were just kind of trying to find a way to fill the void that was left from the father passing. And so we were expecting over the course of that weekend for someone, uh, one of the two brothers, to come to this house and stay with us for a night or whatever it was. I had never met either of these two brothers. I knew they existed, but I had never met them before. But somewhere in the back of my mind, I know that probably one of them is gonna show up at some point, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever it is. Ah, uh, man, it's giving me goosebumps just thinking about this. So that night as I'm laying in bed, I'm thinking about how dark and quiet it is. I remember the, the only light in the room was the digital clock, uh, the little red digital clock, and it was like a beacon in the light. And, and that doesn't emit much light, but when it's pure darkness, it does. And I just could not fall asleep. I, I remember I got to a place where I started counting how many hours of sleep I might get if I fell asleep right then and there, which is never a good sign. That means you're not close to sleeping. If, if you're like, okay, if I fell asleep now, I'll get three hours and 22 minutes of sleep, right? Like that's where I was at mentally. At some point, uh, I think it was around three in the morning. I remember looking at the clock and thinking, wow, it's gotten so late and I'm still, still awake. I hear footsteps on the wraparound porch in a situation where, you know, as I'm telling it, you're going to think, how did you not raise you know, a red flag immediately? In real time, in real life, your brain goes to great measures to convince you that everything is okay. It really takes an enormous amount of, of anomalies to stack up for your brain to say something's wrong. And so that's what happened in this first night. I hear footsteps on the wraparound porch and I immediately assume, even though we're talking, it's like three in the morning, I just assume that it's gotta be one of Nick's brothers arriving to be a part of this, this weekend getaway. So I really actually didn't think anything of it. I, I actually just thought, well, you know, when he comes in the house, if he happens to come in here to check on us, I'll just pretend to be asleep in case, you know, he were to see that I was awake. I don't wanna have a conversation with him. Number one, it's three in the morning. Number two, I, I don't know the guy. I'm, you know, I'm just gonna pretend to be asleep. So that's all I'm thinking about. Not worried, not scared, not anything. Footsteps on the wraparound porch. 
And then the door opens and I can hear the sleigh bells that are on the door itself. I can hear those chime as the door opens. Again, no part of me is concerned about this. I'm thinking it's a little bit weird that they're arriving at three in the morning, but we knew that their brother, his brothers had these weird work schedules where it, they might show up in the middle of the night. So it was just, it, it was whatever it was. Sleigh bells ring. Um, and then I hear a, what sounds like a pot, like a kitchen pot fall and hit the linoleum floor in the kitchen. And I remember just the sounds stood out to me. It just seemed like this person's kind of making a bit of a commotion in the middle of the night here. And the door didn't shut. And I noticed that. Um, I figured they were maybe bringing their stuff in, right? They're offloading some stuff and they're leaving the door open. Oh, this is just thinking about this. It's really making me feel uncomfortable. So I hear the footsteps in the wraparound porch, the door opens, I can hear the sleigh bells, a pot falls and it hits the, the, the linoleum floor. The footsteps that I could hear on the wraparound porch because it's on stilts, right? Like the porch is hovering over the ground. You can hear those footsteps. Well, when, they, when these, these footsteps continued into the house where you're on a concrete slab and there should be no sound, like I shouldn't hear echoing footsteps, it sounded like it was on the wraparound porch still but the noise was getting closer to me. So it was like the footsteps sounded totally natural out on the wraparound porch, but once they were in the house, it didn't really make any sense that I could hear them as if it was, as if the footsteps were standing on something that was suspended off the ground, but it wasn't. You're in the house on a concrete slab. And so I hear these footsteps. The door hasn't shut. The front door is wide open. We're in the middle of winter here. We're in the middle of nowhere too. And I'm thinking about that, but I'm still thinking it's gotta be Nick's brother, one of Nick's brothers. The footsteps continue through the house and they stop about halfway through the house. If you open that door and walk halfway through the house. And then the footsteps began to walk down the hallway towards our room. So they come down the hall and they get right outside the door, which is shut. The door to our room is shut. And I'm sitting there, again, my feet are closest to the door. It's pitch black in the room, minus the, you know, digital clock. And I'm thinking, why didn't they shut the front door? Of all the weird things that have happened, the fact that I'm hearing footsteps as if they're on the wraparound porch, but they're getting louder and moving through the house, the thing that really just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up was, why didn't they shut the front door? That just seems like such a bad idea. There's animals out there. There's a host of things out there. Like, why aren't you shut? And not to mention, it's freezing outside. There's a space between the bunk bed, the bottom bunk that I'm on, and the top bunk. There's a space that I can see clear as day. Whoever walks in the room, I'm going I'm to see them when they walk past the foot of the bed. But because of the top bunk, my view is actually obscured. And I wouldn't be able to make out someone's face, for example. I could really only see their like middle section. And so when the door opens and this shadow figure walks into the room, which by the way, you're, I'm in a pitch black room and I clearly make out a black silhouette. This thing walks into the room and it's, it's obscured. So I wouldn't have been able to see it, its head or upper body anyways, but its hips are so high that I can't even really see those. Those are at the level that I would expect someone's upper body or head to be at, meaning this figure that's walked in, its legs are extremely long. Uh, and so if it was proportionally the size of a human, you're talking about maybe a 10 foot tall person, but we're in a, a space that is not a 10 foot high ceiling. And so this thing walks in and as soon as I see it and I make out that black silhouette, even though it's pitch black in the room, I clearly see the silhouette that is unnaturally tall combined with all the things that I've just thought about, mainly the door's still open, uh, they've made kind of a commotion. I can hear these weird footsteps. I instantly was frozen with terror, frozen, petrified. I, well, one, I'm like, it's not Nick's brother. And even if we're not talking about paranormal here, this is such a bad situation. Even if that's just some dude who's come into the house, that's a really bad situation. So no matter what, this is a really bad situation, but what I'm looking at doesn't make sense. 
It's an unnaturally tall person. They've left the door open and I hear their footsteps all over the house. And it walks in past the foot of the bed. And I'm laying there and I can't see higher than its waist because it's obscured by the top bunk. And this thing makes this like facing movement, like a military facing movement and begins to walk down the aisle between the queen size bed in the middle of the room and the bunk bed where I am. And it's walking down right next to me. And I'm, I'm literally sitting there unable to move. And I remember thinking, I can't do anything. I'm truly frozen with terror. And all I remember thinking is, whatever happens, just don't bend down and look at me. That will ruin my life. If this thing so much as looks at me, that's it, I'm done. So it walks down the aisle, it's right next to me. I can't, I'm, I'm literally frozen. And it does another quick movement, but it's facing away from me now. Facing towards Nick in the center of the room. And it bows onto and then down through Nick's bed and disappears. In the movies, in a movie, as soon as the ghost disappears into the floor, whoever's hiding would make a run for it. In real life, there's no such thing as ghosts. There's no such thing as people disappearing into the ground. So I'm expecting this thing to just get back up again. I, I couldn't understand that it was, what did it, disappear into the bed? That's not possible. Where is it? I clearly, I heard the door open. I heard the bells. I heard the pot. I heard the footsteps. I saw the door open. I see the thing walk in. I watched it walk down the aisle. I watched it bend over. It's in the room. Where is it? And for hours, I mean, all night, I laid there absolutely petrified, expecting this thing to come back up and just look at me. That was like my biggest fear is whatever this thing was, I did not want to, I did not want it to look at me. So that was the worst. I'm laying there frozen. I can only move my eyes all night. Finally, I hear Nick's mom out in the living room making coffee. I mean, this, this was probably like five, six in the morning. And it, it was like the first time that I'm like, okay, I, I, I'm safe now. Even if it's in the room, I'm, I'm safe to just go because I can hear someone out there. And it's, I, could, I could hear her speaking. I knew it was her. And so I go right out there. And now you got to understand that even though this was a horrible situation that I still can't really explain, I know that she has just lost her husband. And so the idea of approaching the subject, which effectively is going to turn into ghosts, right? I've, I've never had a paranormal experience before this. I've never had a paranormal experience since, right? Like I, I'm more or less a skeptic and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start talking about ghosts to the woman who's recently bereaved. It just felt really inappropriate. And so I was really struggling with how I wanted to communicate what happened. And so I went to the table, she got me a cup of coffee and she's kind of, and we know each other well, you know, she knows me well. And she definitely picked up that something was wrong, but didn't really ask anything yet. She was just kind of puzzling, like kind of sizing me up a little bit. And the only thing I could think to do was to just ask, you know, hey, did, did either of your two sons, you know, Nick's older two brothers, did, did they, did they stop by at any point last night? Did they stop by? And she's like, no, mm-mm. -mm. And I'm sitting there like, okay. And I'm just like, I must have had a reaction that was obvious to her. And she just goes, I heard my husband here last night too. And you know, that made it a lot worse. Because on, on the one hand, you have a situation where she is confirming something that part of me hopes is a bad dream. Number two, she's now saying it's her husband. And so I intuitively assumed that she has somehow figured out what I'm stressed about that probably isn't real. And because she's in, because she's grieving, she's created a story where her husband is now in the house, you know, looking over us. I really believed that she didn't hear anything that she just somehow understood that I had had this weird feeling and she'd turned it into a, oh, my husband's in the house. And I just couldn't ask any more questions at that point. I felt like I had, I had 
set her up for this awkward exchange. I felt really bad that like that was the discussion we were having. I also thought like if, if that's true, I don't want to have this conversation. Like I really was just dumbfounded on what to do in this situation. And this is night one. There's two more nights of this and it gets worse. So Nick and Wolf eventually come out of the bedroom and they come to the dining room. And the same way I felt reserved talking to Nick's mom about what happened, I had the same feelings about Nick because it was his father. And I also just felt like that would be inappropriate. But Wolf, he's not a family member and he's my buddy. And I kind of pulled him aside and I kind of told him what was going on as best as I could. But I kept it like kind of generic. I was like, you know, I, I, I could have sworn I heard someone in the house last night. Like I, I could have sworn. And he's like, yeah, you know, you, you're probably dreaming, you know, like that's, that's, that's what this is. And I was like, no, like I wasn't, but I can't, make, I can't make sense of it. And I was like, can you just do me a favor? And at this point, Nick actually overheard the conversation and I kind of, I very much kind of cut ties with what I was talking about. I was like, yeah, I just thought I heard something last night. It's just me freaking myself out. And I was like, can you guys tonight, when we get back from snowboarding, can I fall asleep ahead of you? That way I'm asleep, you guys can just fall asleep after I do and then I'll sleep through the night, no, no big deal. And they're like, all right, yeah, weirdo, whatever. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, my big plan is I'm just gonna go to bed really, really early. Cause I didn't sleep the night before. So I'm thinking, oh, I'll, I'll, fall, I'll fall asleep right away. So we go out, we snowboard for the day. My mind is off of what happened. And, and frankly, I'm starting to convince myself that that had to have been, you know, sleep paralysis even though I'd never had that before. I, I was Googling some stuff and sleep paralysis. Maybe it was just like a really intense dream. Uh, you know, I would just like, it, it, there has to be something. Like this is, this is too weird. I'm, it, it has to be something explainable. Turns out it wasn't. We get back from snowboarding and I am immediately going to bed. Pretty much immediately. It was like maybe six o'clock. I was like, I'm going to bed. And I get in bed and all I'm thinking about is what happened the night before and I can't fall asleep. Eventually Nick and Wolf, they come in the room and they're trying their best to stay awake so that I can fall asleep, but it's getting later and later and I can't fall asleep. And now I'm back to that like, okay, if I fall asleep now, I get six hours of sleep. And they, they finally just said, hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. So they both fall asleep and I'm, I'm awake. And I was so upset with myself. Like, you screwed yourself. Why didn't you just fall asleep, you dummy? And I remember the only thing that I did that really made this real, looking back at it, is I put a knife, like a kitchen knife or something, in the springs above me. So I'm in the bottom bunk, like basically right under the top bunk, I put a knife in there. And I'm laying in bed and I'm constantly looking over at the digital clock. And it was probably around 3 a.m. It was late enough that it was like, okay, this is about the time that happened last night. And my heart just sunk when I heard those footsteps on the wraparound porch again. They sounded the same as they did the night before. I was like, that has to be one of Nick's brothers. But the door opens, I hear the sleigh bells, I hear the frickin' pot fall on the ground. It was like deja vu, the exact same thing is happening. And these footsteps start walking through the house. And again, referencing how movies would portray this, you know, the, the person who's, who's me in the movie is like, okay, I'm gonna get this knife and I'm gonna position myself over here because I know what's gonna happen and I'm gonna protect myself. In real life, I'm like, this thing's gonna be in my room, potentially. It happened last night. It's apparently happening again. Please, for the love of God, don't bow into me the way it bowed into the floor the night before. Don't look at me. It, it, will, it will ruin my life if some entity just engages with me, just looks at me, that will ruin my life. This thing walks down the hall and I hear those footsteps coming down the hall. And just pretend for a second, forget the paranormal aspect. Pretend it's the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. And you, a, a stranger is walking around your house. That alone is horrifying. The footsteps come right outside the door. And I'm looking at the knife that's right underneath 
the bed. And I'm petrified. I cannot move. I'm drenched in sweat. Just from the few seconds that it's taken this thing to go from the door to the front of, of my bedroom. Because I know what's happening again. It's happening again. I'm not crazy. It's just happening again. What the F is this? And I'm petrified. I, I can't reach. I'm so worried about making any noise that would alert this thing that I'm here. That it's, I can only move my eyes. And I remember even thinking that I shouldn't move my eyes too quickly because it, it might hear that. Like this is a primal level of fear. The door opens. It walks into the room. Goes right past the foot of my bed. And I'm, again, petrified. And it walks down. After making its facing movement, it walks down the aisle between me and Nick. And I remember what happened the night before where it folded into Nick and disappeared. And I'm just thinking to myself, please don't turn and bow into me. Please, whatever happens, just don't do that. So it turns away from me and does the same thing it did the night before, folds onto Nick and disappears into the ground. But again, even though in the movies, this would be the same thing happening, you know, night two, it's the same routine. It'd be like, oh, the ghost is in the floor now. I can, I can go alert the authorities because now it's safe. In real life, I'm like, where did it go? I know this happened last night, but it still doesn't make any sense. It's in the room. It has to be. This is a real thing. It, it came in the room. It, it's somewhere. Is it under my bed? Where is it? All night. All night. I lay there. This is the second night that I've not slept. When I heard Nick's mom out in the other room, it was like such a relief because I didn't give a crap at this point about being polite. I wasn't going to like try to, you know, distance myself from the conversation around ghosts. I was going to go out there and be like, what's wrong with this house? And so I hear her and I go right out to the, to the living room and I tell her everything in as acute detail as I possibly can. And as I'm telling her this, her reaction didn't line up. Her reaction was not surprise, terror, confusion. It was empathy. She felt bad for me. It was sympathy. You don't understand. Like I'm listening, but you just, you just don't understand what's happening. And I'm telling her all the, I, I mean, every detail I can possibly muster. And at the end of it, or towards the end, she just kind of stops me. She's like, John, I told you yesterday. And, I, and, and again, I, I heard it last night. That's just my husband. I heard him last night too. He's got nothing to worry about. And I was like, no. No. That, 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 that cannot be, that cannot be what it is. And she was like, I heard him open the door. I heard the pot fall. I heard him walk through the house. I'm assuming he went into to next room again with you guys. And I'm like, what is happening? So totally now just beside myself. I remember I was crying actually, like during this conversation, I'm just crying. Not even like tears of sadness as much as just like, what's happening? Like I, I needed my mom. Like I'm... I felt so helpless and no offense to Nick's mom, but I just felt like I was with a lunatic. How, but like at the same time, she's recalling the exact same things as me. How, how do I put that together? I remember thinking I need to leave. I need to get out of here. I can't be here anymore. But then I thought about like, how am I going to make this happen? Nick's mom and Wolf and Nick, they aren't leaving today. And it was pretty clear that Nick's mom liked the fact that she, you know, heard her husband walking around the cabin. She's not trying to leave. And there's one more night that we're here. And I would have to tell my parents to drive, my mom or my dad, to drive to New Hampshire and come get me. Because I'm seeing ghosts. Like, this was a trip that I loved. I looked forward to this trip. Every year. It wouldn't have made any sense. And they would have been like, what's wrong with you? And I honestly was not prepared to have those conversations with my mom and dad. I was not prepared to be like, let me tell you about the ghost I saw over the past two days. 
And so I was just kind of resigned and decided to stay. In retrospect, um, I think I should have called my parents and been like, that's what parents are for. Like, get the hell up here. It doesn't matter why. Come get me. But it was such a confusing moment that I had no blueprint for how to handle. So I just stayed. Nick and Wolf finally get up. And I remember I made that decision as I'm sitting there thinking about what's happening is Nick's mom is reassuring me, you know, about her husband being in the house. And I make the decision that I'm going to stay. Nick and Wolf come out of the room and they come over and Wolf pretty much immediately looks at me to get a gauge on what happened. And you can see it all over my face. I've been crying. And I told them what happened. And you know, Nick, Nick was always kind of a stoic and he was just unaffected, you know. Wolf, on the other hand, was more inclined to at a minimum believe something was happening. He didn't know if it was a ghost or not, but he certainly understood that something's going on. And the fact that Nick's mom, as I'm explaining to Nick and Wolf what's going on, she was, she was like reinforcing my argument. Yeah, I heard him too. I heard the door open. Yeah, I was upstairs. I heard him walk through the house. And Wolf's like, what's going on? And Nick is like, he didn't want to hear it kind of. It, it probably was uncomfortable. It's about his father or ultimately talking about his father. Before we went out snowboarding for the day, because Nick's mom would drive us and drop us off, she brought us uh, to a, a local store and we bought a coffee table because they've been looking to replace the one that was in their house. Basically, when you walk into the house, instead of turning down the hallway towards our room, if you just keep walking into the lofted area, at the foot of the stairs uh, was a coffee table where they kept a landline phone because you're in the middle of nowhere and you gotta have some way to call and they put it right at the foot of the stairs in this little coffee table. But it had broken or it was old or whatever. I know that they've wanted a new one for a long time. We went out and got it. Me, Nick and Wolf, we go, we snowboard. Um, we come back, we help offload the coffee table into the house, we put it at the foot of the stairs, um, and that night we go to bed. I was ruthless in trying to keep Wolf and Nick awake. I mean, I wasn't even trying to make jokes out of it. I was like straight up kicking the bunk, uh, like kicking Nick, Wolf's bunk, like literally shaking Nick. I was doing everything in my power to keep them awake because I couldn't sleep. I'm terrified. I'm terrified. It was like the opposite of how excited you get before Christmas and you can't sleep. It was like the opposite of those feelings, but you still can't sleep. It was like, this is the worst night of my life. And also the, 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 the nail in the coffin, if you will, is during the day that day, we found out that neither of Nick's two brothers were going to be making the trip. They weren't going to make it. So no one's going to be at the house. No one should be at the house except for us. And so that night I'm laying there and after all my attempts to keep Nick and Wolf awake, they fall asleep. Everyone's asleep. The house is pitch black. It's silent. And around two, three in the morning, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. I hear those footsteps on the wraparound porch. The door opens and I hear the sleigh bells ringing on the door. A pot falls on the ground and the footsteps walk into the house. And this is the third time that this has happened. So in a way, this was the first time that I was expecting something to happen. For it to walk down the hall, to come in the room, to come next to me, fold into Nick, and then that's it. This was the first time I had a little bit of, call it security, that something was gonna happen and I understood what was gonna happen. I didn't understand it, but I expected something to happen. But this was not the case this night. It walked into the house. Everything was the same. It walked into the house, but instead of going down the hallway towards our room, it kept walking into the lofted area. And the lofted area from where I was laying, I, my foot's at the, the door, my head's back here, the wall straight, if I like sat up in bed and looked straight, the wall right there led into the area where this thing was. So I'm talking, I'm basically, if there wasn't a wall, I'd be looking dead at this thing. And I'm waiting for it to walk through the wall. As crazy as that sounds, I'm just anticipating something coming through the wall. After a long pa uh, pause of it being in that lofted area, I hear it go up the steps. Listening to the creak of the steps as it goes up the steps, it makes my skin crawl. 
It's, it's making me like emotional thinking about how terrifying that was. Walks up the stairs and now it's above me. And if the past two nights are any example, this thing has sunk into the ground two nights in a row and disappeared. And so now my fear is it's going to literally come through the ceiling, through the bunk, onto me. The sound stopped when it was upstairs. Got upstairs, and that's where Nick's mom slept. She was upstairs. So I laid in bed, petrified once again. I got my stupid knife sitting in the underside of the bed above me. And hours and hours of waiting for my literal worst nightmare to come true as some entity comes through the ceiling and goes into me. Or even just if it was like onto Nick, if it came through the ceiling and if out of my peripheries I'm watching like this beast come through the ceiling and float down and into Nick. It just, all, these thoughts in my head, they didn't make any sense. They were terrifying, but they were happening. I laid in bed and I couldn't fall asleep. I was now coming up on three days without sleep. So at some point that night, I did fall asleep, probably just out of sheer exhaustion. At some point in the morning, early morning, now probably like five in the morning, I, I wake up again and I can hear Nick's mom it didn't sound like she was making coffee. It sounded like something was wrong. I couldn't place it, but it just sounded like there was, she was acting emotional somehow. I couldn't tell if she was crying or not. But now it's like, it's the morning, it's my last day, I'm leaving today, I'm up, I'm out. And as soon as I walk out, I walk out of the hallway and I look to the left into the dining room where I expect to see Nick's mom and she's not there. And she's actually over at the foot of the stairs in the, uh, the lofted kind of living room area next to this new coffee table we had just put in. And she's standing over this coffee table at the foot of the stairs where the, the entity had been the night before, the one deviation from the other two nights. And she's crying. Come here. She points to the coffee table. And she's down on her knees looking at the table. And now I can tell she's probably crying tears of joy because scratched into the coffee table were the words, I love you. I was like, I'm done. That ended my friendships with certainly Nick. Uh, Wolf to a, a lesser degree, but I never, I stopped snowboarding. I didn't go back to that cabin, even though I know Wolf did the next year. The theories about what happened, you know, Nick's mom, it's possible she could have created a narrative, made it about her husband, and then she could have just as easily scratched that into the table. The I love you, that could have been her. Um, I mean, it's also possible that she had sleep paralysis and I had sleep paralysis and somehow we synchronized and had the same vision and she scratched on the table. Or to be honest, what I believe, that that was a ghost and that it interacted with the physical world and it did walk around the house. It did carve I love you into that table. Um, and you know, I, that's the only time in my entire life that I've had anything happen like that. I don't have any other paranormal stories before or after, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm gonna to continue to do long versions of my ghost stories and scary stories that I find that I usually, that I've been posting on TikTok. I'm gonna do long versions of those uh, on this YouTube channel. That's gonna be the new direction for this channel. If you have a great ghost story, please DM me on Instagram. My handle is johnballen416. J-O-H-N-B-A-L-L-E-N 416. Send me your story on Instagram. You can also hit me up on TikTok. That's Mr. Ballin. Uh, and that's my deal, guys. I hope you enjoyed. This story honestly seems totally made up until you review the police report because the police officially kind of confirm much of what the family claims to be true about their haunting experience. And if that doesn't convince you, there's actually a movie adaptation called Veronica on Netflix and they claim this is true too. So let's see what you think. In 1992, a police station in Madrid, Spain received a frantic phone call from Maximo Gutierrez claiming that he and his wife were being attacked by tall shadowy figures. The responding officer didn't believe his initial claims, but decided to check it out in case it was an actual home invasion. There were no signs of forced entry, no signs of theft. In fact, the police noted that at first, the house was eerily quiet. They called the Gutierrez's back inside to talk to them now that, you know, the house was safe. You know, I'm air quoting. 
Uh, but as soon as they sit down to talk to them, they hear a loud bang out on the porch. The police described it as sounding like a large boulder falling and rolling along the ground. They run out to investigate, but nothing is there. As they stand there puzzled, one of the officers yells, Duck! Just as an armoire door swings open violently, narrowly missing an officer's head. At this point, they think this could be some sort of prank, and they check the armoire. They're looking all over the place. There doesn't seem to be any strings or any way that this could be a prank. There's no one around. At this point, a couple of the officers decide that this is just too much for them, and they want to wait outside. The remaining officers go back into the living room to chat with the Gutierrez's about what the heck is going on with their house. When they sit down to chat, Mr. Gutierrez proceeds to tell the officers about the strange death of their 18-year-old daughter, Estefania, who had passed away just a few years earlier, and why they think that her death is actually connected to their house being haunted. Estefania went to a very religious school, and so when one of her teachers caught her and her friends using a Ouija board, she was really upset. The teacher runs over, she smashes the Ouija board, and tells them that this is not okay, they can't do it. But when she broke up the board, she destroyed the little glass planchette they were using to actually maneuver the Ouija board. And the teacher and the students that were there all claimed to have seen some sort of trapped smoke escape from the glass planchette, and it actually was inhaled by Estefania. Mr. Gutierrez claimed that from that moment on, his daughter's physical and mental health began deteriorating. Estefania started telling her parents about these strange people she kept seeing in the house, especially at night when she was laying in bed. There'd be these shadow figures that would come out of the closet, come in the door, and they'd crawl all around her room. They'd even grab her sometimes at night. Her parents brought her in for testing, and no doctor could explain what was wrong with her. And so without a diagnosis, the parents had to watch in horror as their daughter's condition just deteriorated dramatically until finally she just suddenly died in her bed one night and there was no official cause of death. Shortly after she passed away, her parents started to notice strange things happening in their house and they believe that is when the haunting actually began. As the parents are divulging this information to the police, they all hear screams and banging coming from Estefania's room. The police actually physically jump up out of their chairs, they're so frightened. The police and the father make their way over to the bedroom, they open it up, and inside, no one's in there, even though the screaming continues. The crucifix that normally was mounted to the wall was in the middle of the floor. Where it was mounted on the wall were now these deep scratches dug into the wall that were not there literally probably 30 minutes earlier. The police continued to look everywhere to figure out where the heck the screaming is coming from, but they couldn't figure it out. As they're examining the room, they start hearing pounding in all of the walls. One of the police officers noticed that a picture of Estefania in that room had fallen on the ground, and he picked it up, and the frame itself was undamaged. But the picture inside the frame, which was of Estefania, had caught on fire and had burned through. Outside the bedroom, one of the police officers noted that a strange crimson-colored goo was present in some of the Gutierrez's furniture, an unfamiliar substance that neither the parents or any of the officers had seen since being in the house. Not knowing what to make of the situation, the police leave and suggest the Gutierrez's move out as quickly as possible, and ultimately they do, and they report as soon as they left that house, all of the paranormal activity ceased. The official police report is filled with extraordinary events that the officers present, which included the chief inspector of the police force, swore to have witnessed, leaving this case to be one of the most recent and eeriest unexplained cases in police history. And recently, this case was actually adapted into a movie called Veronica on Netflix, and people are saying it is the most terrifying movie they have ever seen. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and let me know what you want to hear next. It turned out that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming incessantly. In the height of World War II, Russian scientists wanted to find a way to keep their soldiers awake longer. And so they devised this experiment, this human experiment, to test the effects of extreme sleep deprivation. And so what they did is they rounded up five uh, prisoners of war and offered them their freedom if they went through this experiment, which I can tell you went sideways. And so the way it worked is they were going to be put inside of this sealed gas chamber that continuously was going to administer this stimulant gas. 
It was an experimental stimulant gas. This is not something they knew much about, but they were fairly confident that it wouldn't kill them and that it would keep them awake. And so they put them inside the chamber and they started administering the gas. This was not at a time where they had closed circuit cameras. Those weren't around at the time. All they had was, you know, they put microphones in there um, and they had these five inch thick little porthole windows. They had one porthole window where the researchers could look into the chamber itself. So the experiment begins and really for the first three, four days, everything was pretty normal. At about the day four mark, the researchers started to notice a change in what they were discussing, the subjects. Uh, it went from kind of small talk over those first few days to fairly dark. They started talking almost exclusively about traumatic events that had happened to them in their life. And around the day four mark is when they started, the subjects started complaining about being in this test at all. You know, the first few days it was filled with some optimism that this was their ticket out of the terrible situation they were in. And then it really turned into, this is a terrible situation. I think it was around the day six mark, the subjects stopped talking to each other completely. They became paranoid of the other uh, subjects and they went to their own sections of the chamber. You know, and in, in the chamber they had places to sit, there was food, there was water, there was a bathroom. Um, there was books in there to read. Uh, they kind of took up space inside of the chamber. They began to believe that they could kind of like sell out their uh, their comrades in exchange for getting out of this experiment. So they would, you know, one by one come up to the porthole or go over to one of the microphones that was obviously placed inside of the chamber and start whispering these kind of imagined defenses of the other um subjects to try to get them in trouble in exchange for being released from this experiment, which, you know, that, that didn't do anything. You know, the, the researchers, they didn't care what they said. They just listened and watched. After nine days, the experiment took a significant turn for the worst. Uh, it was the morning of the, I think it was the 10th day where the screaming began. Uh, one of the test subjects began screaming. And at this point, Everybody is totally like segregated. They're not talking to each other. They're muttering and whispering. And one of them just starts screaming. And so for three hours, they watch him scream at the top of his lungs and run back and forth across this little chamber until he stopped screaming, but he's still running. And they could kind of pick up on the microphone that he was still making sound, but it was like these little squeaks. It turned out that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming incessantly. The other subjects didn't react to the screaming at all. It was like it wasn't happening, but they're in this confined space, right? It's like so loud in there. And uh, all that happened is as he's screaming, the other subjects began ripping out pages of the book, soaking them and then pushing them up against the porthole glass, obscuring the view. So by the time the subject who had torn his vocal cords stopped, well, by the time he tore his vocal cords and it went quiet, the researchers couldn't actually see into the chamber anymore. And once the, uh, the guy had torn his vocal cords, there was no more sound in the room. So their view was obscured and now it's gone silent. After three days of talking about what they're gonna do, of complete silence in the room, like they can't see in, they can't, it's silent, they're, they're monitoring the oxygen levels in the room and based on oxygen consumption in the room, uh, apparently they could tell that there were people in there, probably at least four or five, that were breathing oxygen because it was, it was being consumed. So they believed they were alive, but after three days of silence, which really didn't make any sense, they determined that, well, either our microphones are, are broken and that's a problem, uh, or there's something wrong with the subjects themselves. So they decide that they're gonna use the intercom to reach out to the subjects and basically tell them that they're gonna they're gonna come into the room. Like, hey, you know, we're gonna test the microphones, we're gonna be coming into the chamber, um, you, you need to lay on the ground and, and not interact with us. If you comply, we will offer one of you immediate release and freedom. So there's silence after they use the intercom, they decide to do that, they talk to the, the intercom and one, of the uh, subjects. Now, to this point, again, for three days, it's been silent. And one of the subjects, clear as can be, 
talks into the microphone and just says, we no longer want to be freed. And so the researchers were like, okay, I guess they're alive and our microphones work, so they don't go in. They, they stay out of the chamber. Silence continues all the way up until the 15th day because, you know, the window's still obscured. The, the subjects are not speaking. They're not muttering. They're not whispering. It's just silence. And uh, on the 15th day, on, at midnight on the 15th day, they, they decide that they're, well, the experiment was over. Um, and so what they did is they flushed the room of the stimulant that had been continuously pouring into the room. They turned that off and they replaced it with fresh air. And that's when they started hearing the screaming from the subjects inside of the, the chamber. They were begging them, the researchers, to turn the gas back on, pleading with them, like begging, please turn it back on as if they were dying. And then they opened the chamber and now they're laying eyes on the chamber for the first time since like the 10th day. So it's been like five days. And they're seeing the chamber with their own eyes for the first time. And it's straight out of a horror scene. Four of the five subjects were still alive. The fifth subject who had perished at some point, there was chunks of flesh that had been taken off of his chest and his leg and had been jammed into the drain in the center of the room. And they had turned on the water in the bathroom and had flooded the room. There was almost four inches of water on the ground, like murky, stagnant, like, you know, lots of gross stuff in their water all over the ground. And uh, there's this, this dead subject. And all four of them uh, have also, there's chunks of their own flesh that's been ripped off of their body. And it was later determined that it was self-inflicted, these chunks of, of meat that had been pulled off of them. Um, and it was not by teeth either, it was by hand. And also they were eating it. So they were ripping off pieces of their body and eating it. The, the food storage that was down there hadn't been touched in days. It was like they had all completely lost their mind and began eating themselves. The subjects did not want to leave the chamber. They just continued to beg for the gas to be turned back on. And so finally they brought in some uh, soldiers to actually extract the, the living uh, subjects out of the chamber, but they fought so aggressively to stay there. And in fact, one of the subjects jumped up and bit the neck of one of the soldiers and he actually bled to death. Also, one of the subjects in the struggle, his spleen ruptured and he bled to death. So now you have two casualties just getting them out of the room. They finally get the, the three remaining subjects, living subjects out of the room and they heavily restrain them. They bring them to a medical facility because they need to go under surgery because they've had chunks of their own flesh ripped off. They're totally emaciated. And uh, the most injured of the three is immediately brought into surgery while the other two were just kind of held in a, in a holding room. And they try to give him a sedative in order to, to prepare him for surgery. This is not the anesthetic. This is just the sedative. And, it, and it's like he's immune to it. You know, they give him a sedative. It does nothing. And he's just like resisting them. And he keeps begging to go back under the gas. And then finally they say, okay, well, we're just going to give him the anesthetic now. And when they bring it out and they tell him, we're going to give you an anesthetic and we're going to give you the surgery, he starts viciously fighting back. He does not want the anesthetic. He's pleading for them not to give him the anesthetic, that he must remain awake. He needs to remain awake, put me back under the gas. And in his struggle to not have the anesthetic given to him, he manages to tear one of the leather straps that was holding him down. So like an extreme amount of force. And then finally, when they give him the anesthetic, they had to give him like 10 times the dosage or whatever just to get him to calm down. Uh, as soon as he fell asleep, he died. So after he passes away, they move on to the next worst off uh, subject, the guy who had torn his vocal cords and couldn't speak. They bring him in for surgery and he can't speak, but he's, he's shaking his head because he doesn't want the anesthetic. He doesn't want to go under surgery and he's fighting with them. And he actually just passes out from exhaustion and he too, once he falls asleep, or I guess falls unconscious, he dies as well. So now there's only one subject left. The other two that had lived to be pulled out of the chamber have now died as soon as they fell asleep. And, and the scientists don't have any idea why. Instead of bringing the last survivor into surgery, because now they've witnessed two surgeries end in death, they decide, let's put this guy back in the chamber and turn the gas back on, because apparently that's the one thing that's keeping these guys alive. And so in preparation for being put back into the chamber, they hooked him up with an EEG that basically measures your brain waves, which I guess they hadn't done to this point in the experiment. 
And so they put them in there and, and the scientists are watching the readout of the EEG. And they noticed that like his lines would just, you know, inexplicably flatline and then go back to, to you know, up and down and then flatline again. And one of them had the wherewithal to look at the subject as it's flatlining. And they could see that every time he closed his eyes, it was like he was micro sleeping, like these little blanks. Basically, every time he fell asleep for a fraction of a second, it was like he was suffering a brain death over and over and over again. And as they're monitoring this, and they, don't, they know what just happened to the other two, they died when they fell asleep. Uh, they're, they're trying to rush to get the gas turned back on to keep this guy alive, but they didn't do it in time. And he eventually succumbs and falls asleep. And they can see before he ultimately dies that uh, initially when he finally fell asleep, the, the EEG showed that he had fallen into a deep sleep. And then he flatlined and his heart stopped and he died. All of the subjects died and no one really knows what killed them. Was it the sleep deprivation? Uh, was it the gas? It could be a mixture of the two, but we'll never know. But either way, uh, all of them died. Now, this is actually just a story and there's no evidence to suggest that it's even true. But during that time frame in the 40s, during World War II, there were known cases of horrific, unethical human experimentation happening. Like, uh, you know, in the, the Japanese, the, that awful Unit 731, I would not suggest Googling that unless you got a really strong stomach. Um, you had in the concentration camps, the German concentration camps, human, ex human experimentation was definitely happening. Um, and obviously Germany and, and, you know, Japan are not. Uh, uh, Russia. But, you know, it was just in this era where human experimentation was definitely happening. So even if this particular story, the Russian sleep experiment is not true, uh, it, I, I wouldn't be shocked in the least if there wasn't a similar study done somewhere. Obviously, the results could vary dramatically, but I do think that it's certainly possible that something like this could have happened. You know, we continue to study sleep and sleep deprivation, and really there's not much known about it. We don't even really know why we sleep, but we do know that you will die if you go without sleep. I think the longest any human went without sleep was like 18 days. Um, and I can actually speak from my own experience. I was a Navy SEAL for seven years and uh, we go through something called Hell Week uh, in initial training where over a period of five and a half days, you sleep for a total of four hours. Not uh, every night four hours, but a grand total of four hours. And, uh, and it's split up into two little chunks, two hours and two hours. And then there's like a 15 minute and 15 minute nap thrown in there too. And you really just lose your mind after 72 hours. I remember I was constantly hallucinating that when I was around my classmates, their head would turn into a big Rubik's cube and start flipping around. And even when I got right next to them, their head would still be flopping around like a Rubik's cube. And that's only 72 hours in. Uh, I can only imagine what would happen in 15 days. So that's gonna do it. I hope you enjoyed the, the my version of the Russian sleep experiment. Go check it out on Creepypasta or just Google Russian sleep experiment. There's loads of stuff on the internet about it. Um, if you're not already, do check me out on TikTok. So my handle on TikTok is the same as my YouTube handle. It's Mr. Ballin. Um, I post videos in there daily. Uh, lots of horror stuff, scary stuff. If you're into that, go check it out. Uh, also, I have an Instagram, uh, John B. Allen 416 is my handle there. More Navy SEAL content on there, but if you're interested in that, go check it out. Uh, and that's going to do it. So please uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, let me know if you want to hear other stories that you think I'd do a good job telling. Let me know and I'll see if I can do it. Uh, and that's going to do it. Thanks, guys.